Moses in Numbers chapter 10 we read last week when the ark of God or when the, the camp was supposed to do Moses will cry out and say let God arise let his enemies scatter before him and they will start moving following the pillar of cloud in the morning or by day and so when I thought about this I decided that well, regardless of the context let's really think about Moses prayer because I believe David was quoting Moses in this song let God arise let his enemies be scattered as the camp set out to follow God the ark of God also was moved the Levites will carry the ark and they will march following the cloud and so the nation will follow behind and that's how it was every time that they would move from one place to another the ark of God was also moved but what does it really mean to us today? You see, David, in what he just read, um, and I read in uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 13, 3 to 14, David said, Let us bring the ark of God, because in the days of King Saul, we neglected it. Did you remember that? That's what he said. And so you may also go to 2 Samuel. Now, chapter 6 to read the story, but let's go back to 1 Chronicles chapter 13. 1 Chronicles chapter 13, verses 1 through 3 says, Then David consulted with the captains of thousands of hundreds and with every leader. And David said to all the assembly of Israel, If it seems good to you, and if it is of the Lord our God, let us send out to our brethren everywhere who are left in all the land of Israel and with them to the priests and Levites who are in their cities and their common lands that they may gather together to us and let us bring the ark of our God back to us for we have not inquired at it since the days of Saul. Verse 4 then all the assembly, assembly said that they would do so, for the thing was right in the eyes of the people. It's continuing. So David gathered all Israel together from Shehor in Egypt to as far as the entrance of Hamath to bring the ark of God from Kirjah Jerim. And David and all Israel went up to Bela to Kirjah, to Rim, which belonged to Judah, to bring up from there the ark of God, the Lord, who dwells between the cherubim, where his name is proclaimed. So this is what David decided to do. He decided to bring the ark from Kirjah, to Rim, to Jerusalem. But it doesn't end there. So they carried the ark of God on a new cart from the house of Abinadab. And Uzzah and Ahio drove the cart. Then David and all Israel played music before God with all their might, with singing, on harps, on string instruments, on tambourines, on cymbals, and with trumpets. And when they came to Chidon's, threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to hold the ark, for the oxen stumbled, the Bible says, that the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and he struck him before, because he put his hand to the ark, and he died before God. And David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah and therefore that place is called Paris, Uzzah to this day, David was afraid of God that day saying, how can I bring the ark of God to me? 
So David will not move me off with him into the city of David, but took it aside into the house of Hobbit, Edom, the Gittite. The ark of God remained in the family of Hobbit, Edom, in his house three months, the Bible says, and the Lord blessed the house of Obed Edom and all that he had. Interesting story. A story you have already heard before. But the question is, why was the ark of God neglected in the days of Saul? Maybe the easiest answer or the simple one would be because he Saul didn't care about the ark. Or the nation didn't need the ark. I don't know. But one thing I remember, and we talked about this last year probably uh, during prayer meeting, we're talking about kings and um, patriots, and we talked about the sons of Eli, remember? And we, we talked about the time when Israel was in war with the Philistines, and the, the people of Israel decided, because they were losing, they had this crazy idea to go and bring the ark of God to the battlefield, thinking if the ark is with them, surely God will also be with them, and they will be able to defeat the Philistines. And so they did. And the sons of Eli, you know their names. What are their names? Hakni and Phinehas. They both joined the people on the battlefield and they stood by the ark of God. The Philistines were, they were so scared when they heard that the ark of God was among the Israelites. But instead of being afraid, they encouraged each other and they went against the Israelites and they defeated them. Killed the two sons of Eli and captured the ark of God. And they took it back to their land. We have won, we have defeated them, we have taken the ark. The God is now under our roof. Now you can imagine the scene. And this is interesting because when you when you study it, you understand that when they took the ark of God to their land, they took it to Ash Ashdod and placed it in the house of Zadok, the, the chief god of the Philistines. You know what happened? I think we should read it. Let's go to First Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 5. It's always good when you read it yourself. 1 Samuel chapter 5. We'll read from verses 1 to 3. 1 Samuel chapter 5. Starting from verse number 1. And the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. And when the people of Ashdod arose early in the morning, there was Dagon falling on its face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and set it in its place again. And when they arose early the next morning, there was Dagon falling on its face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, the head of Dagon, and both the palms of his head, of its hands, were broken off on the thresh, thresh, threshold. Only Dagon's torso was left of it. Therefore, neither the priests of Dagon nor any who come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. Interesting. The idol, their God, could not stand before the ark of the Lord. And he fell 
twice. They did it, they fixed it up the, the next morning, so maybe it was a mistake. The next day, the same thing happened, but this time, the head was, was done, was broken, and also the hands. And they decided this is definitely because of the God of the Israelites. And so the Philistines decided, you know what? We can't keep this thing here. We need to get rid of it. God is no joke. You can't play with the God of heaven, the Almighty God. You can't play with her. And sometimes we we come to church. We have made God our friend that we don't understand that He is holy and needs to be here. Sometimes, even at church, while we're worshiping God, we are on our phones. We are on Facebook. Texting while we're worshiping God. Well, the Philistines understood that this God that they did not know was not a joke. And they needed to get rid of the ark because it did not belong to them in the first place. So what did they do? They took the ark and they sent it around the land. Everywhere this ark of God went, people had tumors, calamities fell upon the people, and every time they said, you know what, take it away, until the time they decided, you know, let's return the ark to Israel. They learned the lesson. But this ark of God, when it was returned to Israel, it remained in Kijak Gerim, in the house of Abinadab, for 20 years. So this happened before King Saul became king. And so he was in the house of Abinadab and he was never required. So in the days of David, David said, it is time for us to bring back the ark of God to Jerusalem because now we have defeated all our enemies. We can now have God dwell amongst us. And so that's why David inquired and he said, let us all go and bring the ark of God back to Israel, to Jerusalem. Now notice in verse 7, in First Chronicles chapter 13, verse 7, David says something. He says, the Bible says, and David asked that the ark of God be put on a new cart. Did you get that? Verse 7. He said, let us put it on a new cart. And the Bible says that Uzzah and Ahalo were driving the cart. And as the story goes on, the oxen that were hooked to the cart, they stumbled and the ark was unbalanced. And so Uzzah thought he could balance it, he could help this ark of God not to fall. And as he reached out and touched the ark, the Bible says God struck him dead. What was wrong, Reverend? What was wrong in him trying to help God? The intention was good, wasn't it? Why did God struck him dead? Now, some of you may say, what an awful and so strict or dictator God is this God that is not merciful at all. The only thing he did was just to, to try to touch the ark. And he was trying to help the ark from falling. But for God, it was something else. You know, sometimes we think the little things we do and we have good reasons for them, it's all good because of our intentions. But God sees beyond that. 
Seen him better. He was a Levite. He knew better. But understand why did David put this ark of God on a new cart in the beginning? Because that's where the false I mean, the, the mistake actually began when David decided for them to put this ark of God on a cart. Where did he get the idea from? Because he did not understand, David was like, he was so angry at God because God was angry at us. Say, so why did God strike him dead? And now, because he did that, he was afraid. And he said, how can I bring this ark to me? And because of that, he put the ark aside because he knew if he continues, <laughs> something worse was going to happen. So all of them, the, the whole procession stopped and they took the ark to the house of Obed, Idan. But let's go back and talk about how in the first place, where did David get the idea of transporting the ark of God on a cart? Because God never told us to carry his ark on the cart. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 6. 1 Samuel chapter 6 verses 7 to 9. 1 Samuel chapter 6 7 and 9. Now therefore, make a new cart. Take two milk cows which have never been yoked, and hitch the cows to the carts, and take the cows home away from them. Then take the ark of the Lord and set it on the cart, and put the articles of gold which you are returning to him as a trespass offering in the chests by its side. Then send it away and let it go. And watch, if it goes up the road to its own territory, to Beth Shemesh, then he has done us this great evil, talking about God. But if not, then we, have, we shall know that it is not his hand that struck us. It happened to us by chance. This is the Philistines talking about how can we return this up to God. Say, so, you know what? Let's put it on the cart and put your offerings and let the cart, let the cows go. If the cows go up to its own territory, then we know all the calamities that fell upon us were really from the God of Israel. But if it goes somewhere else, then we know it wasn't from him. It was this happened by chance. And guess what? As they left the cart, um, the cows went to the direction of Israel. They didn't have anyone to even ride it. God led them to his own territory. Amen? It shows that God is in control. God could have taken this, this ark and float it or disappear and just appear anywhere else. But he wanted to teach these Philistines that no one jokes with him. He is God all by himself and he doesn't need anybody actually to help him. And so the cart was returned to Israel. I mean, the ark of God was returned to Israel on the cart. And so David, when he took the, the ark of God from the house of Abinadab, the cart's idea was there because he came to Israel on the cart. He got the idea from his enemies. And they didn't know better. And this is what Eleanor says in, um, in Patriots and Prophets, page um, 705. This is what she says. 
Listen, um, Let's stop. She says that God did not, um, God overlooked what the Philistines did because they didn't know better. They did not know God's law regarding how to move his heart. And so when they put it on the cart and sent it back to God, God forgave them because they didn't know better. But for the Israelites, the Israelites knew better. And she says, But the Lord could not accept the service because it was not performed in accordance with his direction. This thing is just going on, right? Okay. The Philistines who have not the knowledge of God's law had placed the ark upon the cart when they returned to Israel, and the Lord accepted the effort which they made. But the Israelites had in their hands a plain statement of the will of God in all these matters, and their neglect of these instructions was dishonoring God to God. Upon Azar rested the greater guilt of presumption. And she says that God can accept no partial obedience, no lax way of treating his commandments. By the judgment upon Azar, he de designed to impress upon all Israel the importance of giving strict heed to his requirements. Thus, the death of that one man by leading the people to repentance might prevent the necessity of inflicting judgments upon thousands. Do you understand why we Adventists will be judged strictly? The way God is going to judge you and I will be more strict than the way he's going to judge others because we know better. Yes, you proclaim to the Adventists it comes with the responsibility. It's not just to feel good about knowing the truth, having the three-hundred message, and being the one to proclaim to the world that it comes with responsibility. And so, he's judging and he starts with his church. And probably some of us are being judged right now. We are. What you know, and what you do with what you know, God holds you accountable. God will overlook what the wicked does out of ignorance but not what the just does consciously, willfully. And so if you think that God is just your friend and you can be treated anyhow, think again. Because if we do not understand that we need to do as God says, uh, that that said the Lord should not be debatable. Whether the society tells me something else, whether my pastor tells me something else, but the Bible tells me this is the way, you should do it. And so, thank God today we are not consumed. The way as a lot, a lot of us, we break commandments, after commandments, we do things the other way, and God in His mercy and grace does not consume us. And for, for me, I think it's not a privilege. You know why? Because back then, because He struck us down 
They knew something was wrong. They all knew they did something wrong and they had to repent and change. Today, nothing happens. And so we think we all good. We continue doing the very thing. That is the excuse of God. And so I appeal to you this day and throughout the whole year that it is time for us to probably look again to our own private individual lives and look at the things that God forbid us to do, yet we keep on doing it. It is everywhere, in our churches, everywhere we go. We have copied a lot of things from the other the denominations. And we think it's, it's fine. As long as it works, as long as people come to church, we can have God. We don't have to, to stick to his, his principles as long as we have the church bring more people to church. Does that sound familiar? And so we want to help the work go forward. And so it doesn't matter the methods we use. It doesn't matter what we do. As long as we can get more people to church. We help in God. Could that be the sin of other? David understood that something was wrong. The ark of God needed to be transported in a different way. And he asked, how can I bring the ark of God to me? He understood that God could not be bribed with a new cart. Did you get that? A new cart, it doesn't matter whether it's new, if it's made of gold. It doesn't matter because that's not what God asked for. God will only move on his own terms. David then decided to let the ark rest in the house of Obedina. The Bible says the ark stayed there for three months. During those three months, Edom, Obed Edom, was blessed. His household was blessed. Everything he had was blessed. And that reminds us of where the presence of God is. The Jesus. If you want to receive the blessings of God, you've got to have God be present in your life. If you want this church to be blessed this year, We've got to have God's presence in this place. And all of us need to understand and revere Him and accept Him the way He is. Worship Him the way He wants, not the way I want. That's all. When David saw that God blessed this man, always, he said, well, if he blessed him, that is his hope. Because he struck us, he, he died. But this time around, he's blessed this man. That means there is hope. I can still bring the ark of God to Jerusalem. And so David sent out the word again and said, let's go. Let's get the ark of God back to Israel because I want it in Jerusalem. Now instead, of giving up on the ark, he decided this time to do things differently. He went and researched, how can we move this? And because it was written down, they found out that the only way you can move God, I would say, the only way you can move the ark of God was by putting it shoulder high. It's not on the cart. The Levites were to carry it. Where? Not like this. Shoulder high. On their shoulders. Because God is holy. And God 
It's about an order, about a detail. Shola has to. And this is what I really enjoy as I study this. It says not only the Levites were allowed to carry the ark of God, but there was a specific family among the Levites that were ordained to carry the ark of God. It's a family of Kohath. Azra was not in that family. He was there. And so, even within the Levites, you also have specific people that were supposed to be that child. Understand this too. When God set people aside for something special, we have to respect that order. Sometimes we think we can just do anything. It doesn't matter. Well, the pastor does it, I can do it. The elder does it, I can do it. God has order. And the church is following after that. Order sometimes means control. But when it's biblical, we should follow. Why did he choose choose Kohat's family? I have no idea. But one thing I know, it is written. And the Israelites knew that that's what God wanted. And so, do not step out of your bounds to do something that you were not consecrated to do. Do not step in somebody else's job to do something God did not even call you to do. We all have our gifts. Let's stick to that. With reverence, Patrick and Prophets, page 706, it says, With reverent care, the ark was now placed upon the shoulders of men divine, of divine appointment. The multitude fell into line, and with trembling heart, the vast procession again set forth. The second time, after advancing, six paces the trumpet sounded at the heart. And by this direction, sacrifices of oxen and fatlings were to be offered. Just look at the whole thing. It was so beautiful. They carried the ark and they were walk. One, two, three, four, five, six, and then on the seventh day, they stop. Does that tell you something? That on the seventh day, you need to stop and remember that God created you. The seventh day, they will stop and they will offer sacrifices and they will carry again and they will continue. One, two, three, four, five, six, they will stop. They needed to remember that God was moving with them. Moving the ark of God was not just a simple thing, it actually meant moving God back to Jerusalem. It was a special thing. And God wanted it to be special. They learned his lesson, and this time, he did things the right way. The right way. Walk on water and stop and remember that God is the one sustaining you. I wish today we will every time remember God. I wish today on Sabbath we will take time to really think of the one that sustained our life, not just check in and check out, but really stop. And think of all the things we have received from God. And think of the things that we need to change in our lives. It's not about us. It's all about Him. Our God and Savior. Brothers and sisters. David had a good intention to have God dwell in Jerusalem. He wanted to have the heart of God be there and even build a temple for God. But God could only be moved on his own terms. You want God to be in your life? 
and you want God to come and dwell in your home on your terms, it doesn't work that way. If you want God to come and dwell in your house, in your church, in this church, it will have to be on His terms. Remember this as we close. God cannot be right. Let me put this one into perspective. It doesn't matter what you may have. It doesn't matter how much you give to the church. It doesn't matter if you, if you return your tithe faithfully and you give more. And thinking because you do that, you can do things your way. It doesn't work that way. It reminded me of a story I, I heard in a country that I love so much. I'm not going to say which country it is. But an elder was able to get a contract from the church to do a certain job for the church. And he overcharged the church. What he bought was not the amount that he originally purchased. It. And later on, the, 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 the church members knew what the elder did. And so they decided on the other you know, the committee not to re-elect him for the following year. And when he found out that he was not re-elected, one Sabbath morning, people came to church and the sanctuary was empty. Where are the views? Where are the chairs? Well, they're gone. Who took them? The elder did. Why? He donated it to the church. And so, because he was not re-elected, he was hurt, and he decided to take with him everything that he gave to the church. Thinking that because you have made all this, that you have the right to do as you please in the house of God, steal from God, and expect that they will re-elect you and put you back to that position, they say no. God cannot be blind. Doesn't matter what you do at church, understand that God has rules, and when you disobey, there are consequences. We have to live with the consequences. God's way is the only way. And the next thing is God cannot be helped. As Isaac tried to help God, forgetting that God could even make the ark float in the air. Spin around as he wishes. You cannot help God. And so put that in mind, that in my life, when I want something, when God promised me something, it is not my responsibility to have God accomplish it. Sarah and Abraham, they tried it. They saw how that turned out. Trying to help God. Well, us also did so. He ended up in debt for him. Let God work in your life. Allow him to be God. He's God himself. He does not need our help. He needs our willing heart to use us to accomplish his feelings. Christians today have forgotten that if we will continue in our ways, if we continue to help God by sugarcoating the truth, just to have numbers at church. It's not the one work. Sometimes we have God like that. We preach nice messages all of our love, inclusive. When people come to church, they're happy. But is that what God wants us to do? He's preparing mentions for us all. But God is not preparing to have anyone go to heaven. He's preparing 
faithful, obedient children to go to heaven. And if I, if my elders, if the pastors in here start preaching to you messages that you want to hear, you like to hear, you might feel good to hear, and you won't make it. And God does not want us to help us that way because He will do it His way. Not by the calling the truth. God does not change His requirements. Remember that too? God's requirements never change. Why? Because God says in Malachi 3 6, I, for I am the Lord, I change my That's why you, sons of Jacob, are not consumed. God does not change. If God said, Poor, is an unclean food, is not going to change it. If God says Sabbath is Sabbath, he's not going to change it. If God says homosexuality is an abomination to me, he's not going to change it if the society says so. God changes not. And so whether you like it or not, God is God. It's up to us if you will follow him or turn away from him. So many things to tell you. But remember, this year, if you want to be successful, if you want to be prosperous, if you want God to be in your life, if you want God to be in our church, we have to get away from practices of the society. We have to hold on to these requirements and the will of God and do it as He helps us to keep His will. God is ready to live with us eternally. But some of us are not ready to live with God eternally. Some of us think. You want to have fried chicken here? If there are things that we know will not be in heaven, why would you want to have it right here? Why do you want to continue doing things that probably you know that are not going in heaven forever? God is preparing you and I for eternity. And for that, there are sacrifices. We hate sacrifice. We just love the end result. It doesn't work that way. I want to lose weight, but I don't want to stop eating some stuff. I want to lose weight, but I don't want to exercise. So what do I do? I buy stuff, I just sit down, and then the instrument does everything for me. Is that not the way it works? Sometimes we think Christianity is like that. I sit down, and the church pastor does it for me. I sit down, and Christ does everything for me. Because that's how, what he does. He does not work that way. God's requirements are for us to keep, but for him to help us keep it. Not for salvation, but for help to him. Lastly, God's presence fortunes the wicked. Let God arise. Let his enemies flee. Let those who hate God scatter the fall. When I read this, I thought, could it be that if we invite God in our lives, those who hate God will flee from us? Let me rephrase it. Could it be that if I decide to have God be in my home, maybe my children will leave the home because they can't stand God's way? Could it be that if we pastors, if we elders, start putting the ark of God, which is the law of God was in the ark of God, raising it high, show it high, 
for everyone to see in this church. Would it be that? It would torture some of our members. The question is, I mean, the answer is yes. That's why David says, like vapor or like smoke is driven away, and so the wicked will be driven away. And as wax melts before fire, they will also melt. This is what I want to address to you and children. Probably, if we invite God to be the master of our church, some will have to leave. Some will be driven away, beautiful. Some will just melt and remain. But the, the beautiful thing about that is sometimes we worry so much about how people will feel then what needs to be done? We repeat that. Sometimes we worry so much about the enemies of God that God himself or what he wants us to do. It is something that you cannot change. Whether we like it or not, if you do what is right, some of your friends will not want to, to, you know, to, to fellowship with you because of the new ways. The world will hate you for doing what is right. And so it does not change at church. If we start to do what God wants us to do, we need some people who are not like it. But some of them. That's fine. It's fine, you know why? Because God has his way to convict their heart. If we, on our knees, pray for them. We need to continue praying for one another until the person understands and the person comes back to them. And this is the consequences of moving God back to church. His enemies will be tortured. And that's why, you know, um, we understand that if you cannot stand God right here, what makes you think you can stand him forever in heaven? If you cannot stand his character, his requirements right here, what makes you think when you go to heaven, all of a sudden you're going to be like, holy, holy, holy? It doesn't work that way. That's why the sinner, the wicked in heaven will be tortured. Heaven will be tortured to him because he can't stand. The righteousness of God. The righteous rejoices in God's presence. And that's mine. And that we will rejoice in God's way. We will rejoice in, in God's righteousness and His presence. And David says, as I close, but let the righteous rejoice. Let the righteous be glad. Yes, let them rejoice. It's sin. Today, it is important for us to move with God, but it is also important to have God come to our lives. He wants to do something. That's what he wants to do. Are you ready for the consequences? If you refuse to have him here, you will have to flee away. But if you want to have him and abide and follow him, you will rejoice. And you will rejoice exceedingly. And that's my prayer for all of us today. Is it your prayer? Say, God, I know you might be tough, but I am willing to allow you to make the changes I need to make this. And I want to be in my life, not once, but every single day, moment of my life. 
If that's you, it's hard to say what you want. God does not want anyone to be driven away, but He wants everyone to come to repentance and receive eternal life. And so, Lord, you have seen the children and stand before you. You know their hearts, you know where they are spiritually. And I do know that your desire is that every single one of us will come to the level of maturity that you want us to get. As you transform us, as you reform us, as you revive us, dear Father, we pray that OIC will be a church that the leaders who put your love your character so high that every single one that comes through the doors of this church will see you and your character lifted on a weekly basis. But Heavenly Father, I also pray that you be with our members, that in your homes, that your love will also be lifted up. In your working place, that your love and your character be lifted up and that they will submit themselves to your will and your ways. For there is only the only way for us to be happy in you is when we do it your way. We thank you for hearing us and thank you for touching our hearts and transforming us for we accept and we welcome you in our hearts and our church Today, I'm going to This is our own prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.